Welcome to our celebration of service. And it happens to be World Polio Day. So we're gonna have a chance to talk about that in a few minutes. I'm Ron Barnes. I'm honored to be the president of this wonderful organization that serves the community of Bloomington and beyond. A quote of the day, I think it's fitting as to what's going on. Grit is the extra something that separates the most successful people from the rest. It is passion, perseverance, and stamina that we must channel in order to stick with our dreams until they become reality. Travis Bradbury. I'd like to also welcome uh, Tim Jessenbach, who was in the Middle East and uh, saw the tensions in the Middle East. And he's going to give a reflection next week that will kind of share some thoughts about what's going on. So we look forward to hearing from Tim next week. Our reflection is John Diltz, past president. Good afternoon. My name is John Diltz, and uh, I'm uh, the chair of your peace building, peace building committee. Uh, so let's talk about peace. Abraham, Abraham Lincoln and Rotary's Paul Harris were both lawyers uh, and both practiced in Illinois. And other than that, they had almost nothing in common. Lincoln uh, was born in rural Kentucky, grew up in rural Indiana uh, before moving to rural Illinois. He was self-educated and a folksy politician. Harris, on the other hand, was born in Wisconsin and grew up in New England. He attended Princeton and was a graduate of the law school at the University of Iowa. He was a city lawyer and practiced in Chicago. Their lives did not overlap at all. Lincoln died in uh, 1865 and Harris was born three years later in, in 1868. But they shared a mutual belief that the best remedy for conflict is conversation. The best way to settle a dispute or avoid one is by listening to an opponent. And as Paul Harris said, quote, look beneath the veneer of life to the solid substance which lies beneath, unquote. They each recommended addressing the source of a problem rather than litigating the problem through an uncertain lawsuit. I don't know about Paul Harris's caseload but Lincoln handled about 5,000 cases between 1836 and 1860. Of those cases, he settled about 1,600 out of court. That's about a third of Lincoln's cases. He did it by talking people through the dispute. In at least 92 cases, the court allowed him to represent both sides in an effort to mediate a deal. Lincoln saw his role as a counselor for his client and an advocate for peace. He advised his fellow lawyers, and this is Lincoln, quote, discourage litigation, persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can, point out to them how the nominal winner is often the real loser in fees, expenses, and a waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There's plenty of business enough, unquote. Both Paul Harris and Abraham Lincoln understood what we sometimes forget. Making peace is always in our best interest. Thanks, John. And if you're looking for a good road trip, Springfield, Illinois has a wonderful Lincoln Museum and, and Center that I'm sure you would enjoy. Uh, introducing our guest today, we have Tracy Jadomovich. Tracy?
Thank you, Ron. And as I call your name, if you would please stand so we can recognize you. Patty Peterson, guest of Mark Peterson. Diane and Randy West, guests of Jim Bright. Mary Beth McCaig, guest of Dick McCaig. Adam Terwilliger, guest of Jeff Hoswell. Amy Jackson, guest of Dame Charlotte Zitlow. David Sabah, guest of Judy Schroeder. And Joy, do we have any guests online? Tracy, we are a Zoom space of entirely Rotarians. All right, there you go. Thank you much and welcome guests. We have some birthdays to celebrate. Susie Graham on October 22nd and our, one of our newest members, David Wright on October 26th. So happy birthday to the two of you. We have some anniversaries also. Tom Boone, 16 years in our club, but 40 years total in Rotary. And Peter Croner, 19 years in our club. And Bill Murphy, 16 years in our club and 44 years total in Rotary. So congratulations for your service, gentlemen. Also, as I said earlier, this is World Polio Day. And uh, Tyler, if you'll put up some information and Yvonne Trevino, Trevino is going to help with some, uh, we have some, this is a kind of a special event where it's Pinky Day, Purple Pinky Day. We have purple markers and to show our solidarity with Rotary International, uh, we're going to ask that that uh, we'll pass these around and you can mark your pinky. It doesn't mean you voted in Iran. It just means that you're you're um, supporting World Polio Day. So uh, th thank you for that. But if you will proceed with the PowerPoint. Is there a PowerPoint with that? OK, mm -hmm. then you've you've seen all there is to see, but it's an opportunity to uh, have a wet pinky. We do have a new member installation. Again, thanks to our membership committee for their solid work in helping our club grow. I think we heard at the, the um, board meeting last week that we're over 150 members now, which is a strong group of, of people that wanna serve this community. So Tracy and Aaron, if you will come forward. And Jeff Richardson. And Hannah's coming forward too. Very good. And sponsors, right. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. We got sidetracked with the pinking. Be careful. It's wet. Don't touch your clothes. All right. So who am I missing? Where's Aaron Davis? There we go. Sorry, Aaron. I wanted to catch you with your mouth full. So this is the special time where we welcome new members. And I will turn it over. We'll do the bios first. Actually, Charles, Hannah, and Andrea, if you guys could come over to the side here. And we'll have Jeff read the bios, and then Aaron will uh, read the induction. All right, good afternoon. Andrea Murray, so glad you're here with your daughter. Andrea grew up in Bloomington and graduated from University High School in 1967. She received her B.A. at the University of Chicago, one of our premier institutions in our country, and then spent a few years looking at options. Her explorations led to her, uh, to her to Florida, where she landed a job as a police reporter, where she started her 40-year career in journalism. She returned to Bloomington in the 1980s to start a family and joined the Herald Telephone shortly after her daughter Hannah was born. Andrea retired from the HD about eight years ago as a managing editor. She deeply appreciates the importance of local news as a service to the community. She is married to Scott Burgess, who teaches at the IU School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Andrea's special interests are her grandchildren, reading, cooking, exercising, gardening, travel, and knitting. She is a 70 plus year member of the Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church and involved in the Sycamore Land Trust. She is eagerly looking forward to offering more dedicated and passionate service to her community in her retirement. Thank you, Andrea. All right. 
Charles Pierce. I noticed that 70 year membership at, at the University Unitarian Church. That's, that's a good run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good yeah, run. Good yeah. Charles Pierce, a Bloomington native. Charles earned his Eagle Scout Award, graduated from Bloomington South in 2000, spent two years in AmeriCorps uh, programs, and then attended Indiana University. He graduated in 2010 with a degree in video design and production and a studio art minor in digital art. Was a multifaceted skill set in branded communications, social media, marketing, and photo video production. Charles has worked in Atlanta, Chicago, Austin, and now in Bloomington in a variety of roles with organizations big and small. Currently operating in an independent freelance capacity, you can find Charles all over the city filming, advising, creating art, and telling stories. Charles also founded the Bloomington Motion Artist Group, BMAG, inspired by similar meetup groups in Chicago and Austin. BMAG is a low barrier monthly meetup group for media centric creatives to socialize and network. His spouse, Sarah, is a senior uh, QA engineer, automation lead with 10 years of experience, and he loves trying new restaurants with Sarah. Together, they have two children, Katie, 12, and Alex, 10, in the Bloomington Public School System. And Charles loves to spend time playing fun video games with his kids. And I'd like to know at what age they start beating him constantly. Already, already beating him, all right. We are grateful for Charles' outstanding presentation to our club several weeks ago. We welcomed his enthusiasm for his work and life then and look forward to him bringing that same kind of energy and optimism to our club in the years ahead. Welcome, Charles. Okay. Andrea Miller and Charles Pierce. On behalf on behalf of the board and membership of the Bloomington Rotary Club, it is a great pleasure to welcome you as the newest members of our club. We look forward to the fellowship that we share, as well as your participation in the club projects that make our club, community, country, and world a better place. Though Rotary is not a political organization, Rotarians are vitally concerned with good citizenship and the election of effective leaders to public office. While Rotary is not a religious organization, it is built on those highest principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business, professional, and community leaders pledged to uphold the highest ethical and moral standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and peace can be achieved when people work together and uphold the Rotary motto of service above self. Rotary activities exemplify the partnership, respect, and generosity that one would expect from people who believe they have a responsibility to help others. Andrea and Charles, you have been chosen for membership in the Bloomington Club because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in our community. And because you possess the qualities to champion the message and principles of Rotary. You are a representative of your vocation and talents within our club and community. You have now become an ambassador of Bloomington Rotary, carrying the ideals of service to all within your sphere of influence. Our community will know and judge Rotary by your character and service. We will also look to you for inspiration as we strive to become better Rotarians. We will now pin you with the distinguished badge of a Rotarian, your Rotary pin. We ask that you wear your Rotary pin with pride in your many endeavors and as a symbol of our recognition of your contribution towards a better world through your Rotary membership. Fellow Rotarians, please rise if you are able and welcome our newest Rotarians, Andrea Miller and Charles Pierce.
<laughs> well, I was just reading it. <clears throat> Please, some pictures now. <laughs> So where do you want it? Uh, right in front of Panel. the flag, right over here. Um, it's usually over here. If we can have you right over here. <laughs> <laughs> Now that we've had our Kodak move it moment, we'll move on. I do want to mention on World Polio Day that, I, and I failed to mention this earlier, that the Gates Foundation has matched funds with Rotary International to help us eradicate polio throughout the world. So this has been quite an endeavor over the past many years. And I think all Rotarians should be proud of the efforts that have been made in eradicating polio around the world. At this point, I would like to uh, introduce Phil Eskew, who will introduce our program today. Phil knows school business well because he served many years on the Car Carmel School Board member, and then he was an IU trustee, so he knows the business well. So, Dr. Eskew. Thank you. I uh, also grew up as a superintendent's son. So going to high school as the son of a superintendent is a unique experience, but you learn things. It was the only reason I played sports in uh, high school is because my dad was superintendent. But, uh, um, our speaker today was introduced last week. They read the bio, which I had prepared to read. Then the bio was placed in the uh, newsletter, so you know all about Jeff. But uh, Jeff is from Corridon, where my father's family is from. He knows my uh, cousins and things down there. So let me tell you a little bit about the job of a superintendent of schools. I don't know how much you know about our school system here in Bloomington, but there's 23 buildings. Think about taking care of 23 buildings the health and safety of those buildings, the uh, police officers and things that we must do to keep these students safe. There's over 10,000 students in our school system. Think about how you educate and prepare those students for the future. There's also 239 extracurricular activities for these 10,000 students. Think about that. That's not just sports. That's theater. That's music. That's all kinds of things. And by the way, the uh, girls' soccer team is going to be playing for the state championship next Saturday. Think about feeding these students. There's 130 food workers in the school system. They s serve at 21 schools. They serve 7,500 meals a day, and 1.3 million breakfasts and lunches per day. Think about the maintenance of all those buildings. Think about the school buses. How many school buses do you think Bloomington has? It's about 110 that you have to take care of. They're building a new facility out there for them right now. And not, don't forget special education that you have to educate these students. I know Jeff is very involved with the referendum at this time. And part of that is for preschool education, which is vitally needed. So I'll let him talk about the referendum, but I wanted you to be aware of the magnitude of the job that he faces here in Bloomington as a superintendent of the Monroe County Community School Corporation. Jeff? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Eskew. I, I'm a, a, a pacer and I talk with my hands. So I'm in trouble because I know that this is being recorded. So I've been told to stay planted. But I'll probably still talk with my hands. I'll tell you a funny story a few, in, a few jobs back. 
I was uh, doing a presentation and the media described me as a teriyaki chef because I guess I used my, my hands excessively. So I'll try to be mindful of that. I remember, remember the old game show, the uh, $25,000 pyramid. I think the amounts have gone up, but I remember people had to, they had little straps so that you didn't talk with your hands when you sat in the chair, when you were trying to win the big prize money. So maybe, maybe that would be a strategy. Um, I do look forward and do greatly appreciate not only the opportunity to join Rotary, but the opportunity to share with you a little bit about um, our 2023 referendum, as well as answer your questions. And uh, I, I knew when, when I was being introduced by Dr. Eskew that there could be no better person to introduce and provide a few insights into the life of superintendency, because in many ways, uh, directly, he has lived that. And his uh, curriculum vitae, if you will, in terms of the services he provided for educational entities K through 16 is huge. So I have so much respect for Dr. Eskew. And uh, we, we, as we were sitting there this morning, we talked about our common ties to the Ohio River Valley and Cordon, Indiana and his family, and my family. I grew up on a farming family just west of, uh, just east of Cordon, between Cordon and Lanesville there in, a, in the valley. And I see Randy West who kind of lived in the same valley. So uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of familial connect, connections, but also a lot of, um, a lot of expertise in, um, K-12 education. And in many ways, everybody has expertise in K-12 education because you are all student ones, right? So, uh, so I think we all have that in common. And I, think, I hope that the other thing that we commonly share is appreciation for the foundational necessity and importance of education and building a better and more just um, civil society, right? I mean, that's, in essence, that is. Education shall forever be encouraged it's engraved in the school of education when you walk through the the doors uh from the north so uh thank you again and we do um there's so many things we could talk about but i i also know that i'm i'm batting right after last week's presentation about food so i'm like wow that's a little bit unfair because i'm more interested in food myself so uh i appreciated that yesterday and the expertise of the ht and 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 the role they play in, in helping introduce us to new opportunities to eat which everyone likes to do. And so, yeah, we, our organization, we have uh, approximately uh, 900, 800, 900 uh, certified staff. The number I was looking at this morning was 825 teachers, about 2,000 employees, a budget that we are approving tonight of approximately $161 million um, um, on an annual basis. So we talk about the buildings, we talk about the operations, we talk about the, the 10 to 11,000 students um, we have partnerships and contracts to serve uh, early childhood, but also career uh, um, eight school districts that we that we service through our Hoosier Hills Career Center. So it's a lot of a lot of adults, a lot of staff, uh, a lot of um, a lot of students, um, and a large uh, footprint, right? And I attended uh, IU here as an undergrad um, and and as a graduate, I got my doctorate here. So um, from beginning to end, post secondary, and uh, you know when you're an undergraduate, you just sort of live between 3rd Street and 17th Street. It's just your little world. And you don't realize this impressive network of people and services and organizations that not only support the university, but support the people that support the university. And then this entire livelihood that exists in this community outside of 3rd to 17th Street. So it's interesting that I'm making that observation probably right geographically in the middle of between 3rd and 17th Street. So. Nonetheless, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And like uh, I know uh, Dr. Eske was talking a little bit about our operations. We are getting ready to do a ribbon cutting incidentally on a, a new transportation of uh, um, canopy and facility. We really are trying to be mindful of, of, of community tax dollars. There are significant federal rebates right now. And so we are, we know it's the right thing to do environmentally, but we know fiscally it is. So we are in the process of installing a significant amount of solar panels on our buildings. Um, they're less visible. It used to, those used to be placed a lot in, on the ground. Um, there were concerns that you know, you're taking up a lot of green space. And now the technology developed where it's actually cheaper in most cases to put them on the roofs. We're preparing to install one um, megawatt, I think is the term, uh, of, 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 of energy production on both North and South High School. Um, those projects are hoped to be created next year. Um, and the savings of those, uh, along with the ones we've put on our administrative building and elsewhere, is already going to put it at around $250,000 a year. Um, so we really are investing, and the more money we can save, the less money we can spend on energy, 
the more money we can put on, provide, on paying for the people that are vital to the work we do. And uh, I do want to comment that this is on the heels of a 2022 referendum in which the sole focus of that was on salaries and wages. We went to the community and, and the, the, the most of that increase um, was to pay our teachers more and to pay our hourly wages more. We were having significant um, shortages of teachers as well as staff. Um, and you noticed it. I mean, people told us, you know, pay our teachers more. We understand um, a statistic I will share is that since 2015 and, and really before that, um, the average increase for public education on a per pupil basis and overall funding from the state of Indiana has been 2.5%. And we know the inflationary rates have been significantly higher than 2.5% over the last, uh, the last decade. So what does that mean? That means for in 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 inflation adjusted dollars, we have less money. And that's not just the case for MCCSE, that's for school districts all over Indiana. Um, and it makes it really hard to attract and retain high quality candidates. We know that there are less people going into education for a myriad of reasons. And there are less people that we have been able to identify and compete for wages for the jobs that Dr. Eskew defined, right? The, the bus drivers, the, the food service workers, the custodians, the, the, the office staff, um, paraprofessionals, on and on and on. So fortunately, and I, and I will give this full disclosure, there's nothing equitable about school funding in Indiana. There isn't, it's, it's a tragic thing. I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, we have communities that need more funds and, and their community members say no. We have others that say we're not even gonna ask. We have communities that um, are disinvested communities, quite honestly, across particularly rural Indiana. Um, we have poverty that's increasing. And we also know categorically that it costs more to educate a student of poverty, right? We know these things. And so here we are faced locally with this quagmire do we ask our community to invest in education disproportionately to enhance the quality of life, the educational opportunities, and ultimately the outputs and outcomes to make our community stronger when other communities aren't doing this? That's a tough question. And it gets back to this fact that there is nothing equitable about school funding in Indiana. But nonetheless, when the state uh, um, disinvests and underfunds education, we felt it was important to ask our community to do so. We had a series of conversations last year, and as part of those conversations, I know what you're thinking. If he spends 10 minutes on slide one, there is no way we're going to be out of here before 5 p.m. I promise I'm going to pick up this. This is just the wind up. So anyway, uh, when we went to our community conversations, the main, converse, the main point we had was we've got to fill our teaching positions and we've got to fill our, our support staff positions. And our community did that. They increased by 10 cents our referendum rate, and that allowed us to immediately Increase teacher salaries by four thousand five hundred dollars. Still not enough, but still approximately ten thousand dollars above the state average, which has allowed us to compete. Now, unfortunately, that means that this year, approximately two thirds of our teachers are coming from other school districts. So it's shifting the problem, not solving the problem, and that's unfortunate. We also know it costs more to hire a new teacher than to keep a teacher, and we also know that when we hire a teacher with a lot of investment and experiences elsewhere, it is a, a boon for us, right, compared to elsewhere. So there's a lot of challenges in Indiana in public, uh, in public education. But we did that. If you take $4,500, you divide it by a year's worth of work and divide it by eight hours, you come up with $2.25 because we did want to be fair. So then we increased our hourly wages by $2.25, which puts our starting wages now at above $15.50 an hour. And suddenly we have filled those um, support staff positions. And aside from last minute resignation, we opened our year fully staffed for the first time in about five years. And that is all because the community was willing to invest additional monies that our state hasn't done recently. It's a great thing and we're proud of that. And we're, we are reminded on a, on a daily basis of what that means. You know, two years ago, if we had, a, I'll give you an example. We had a, snow, uh, a little bit of snow on the ground. It is Southern Indiana. And, you know, if there is climate change, we know there's less of it, but nonetheless, we had a little bit of snow on the ground and normally we would call it two hour delay, right? It's common, you guys know what this means, right? What time do we, I like it when we get the phone calls and it's, sometimes we just have to laugh a little bit. I like, I like, I was belonged to Rotary for about 10 years in Kokomo and I like that your last number five, the addition, right? Is, is, it, is it fun, right? 
or have right i think that's that's awesome so occasionally I, i'm going to be mindful that you like to have fun and, and throw a, a a funny joke in so we always when we do the two hour delays we get the phone call saying what time does school start and we just think that's great right we're like well two hours later well what time well it starts at eight it's gonna start at 10. so uh those calls come pretty frequently and i'm like okay thanks 10 o'clock great great so um nonetheless when you don't have enough bus drivers you have to pull from your uh, custodians and your 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 um, your operational staff, who also are responsible for putting salt on the sidewalks and getting school ready and plowing. So what we came across was many situations where instead of a two-hour delay, we had to cancel school. What does that do for families? What does that do for businesses? Well, parents have to stay home unexpectedly. They can manage two hours, but they have to stay home for the day. They call their they call their employees. Say, I can't come in today. There there are this trickle down effect, right? So we're really pleased that now we are fully staffed and it makes a big difference for us. More importantly, it makes a big difference when teacher, when our students go into school and they have a certified teacher they know in a relationship, it isn't a sub, it isn't a resignation, we're not collapsing to. So their educational importance is, is far greater than the example I gave you on a, on a snow day. But nonetheless, you see how it affects. So here we are coming into this school year and uh, we have uh, fully staffed and we are grateful for the community. So I'm gonna lead this off by the question, so why are you asking for more? It's a fair question, right? I think it is. And when we did our community engagement uh, surveys and, and meetings in 2021 and 2022 and developed a strategic plan, which is on our website, there were two major things that developed. One of them was staffing and paying them more. And one of them was early childhood education because we know that there's a quality of life issue and we know it's a child care issue, it's a workforce issue, but it's also a ready to learn issue. And we're going to talk about that mostly. And so the challenge we faced was, do we put both of those together? And we've also been mindful that it would be unfair and disingenuous to ask this community to increase their taxes on something the state's going to pay for. We wouldn't do that. And after 25 years of lobbying through the Superintendent Association, the Indiana Urban School Association, the School Board Association, da, 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 we had significant belief that the state was going to fund its responsibility and pay for early childhood education for the 23-24 school year based upon $2 billion worth of revenue surpluses at the state level. Now is the time. Now is the best time, right? And so we thought, let's wait one year. There was some urgency there, but we thought, well, let's wait a year, it's gonna be funded. Indiana is one of only seven states that doesn't fully fund pre-K, right? So it's not like this would be, you know, I've been told Indiana is a number 33 state. They, on average, are the 33rd state to do something. Um, you know, we're fiscally conservative Midwesterns, we're Midwesterners, I understand. So we thought it was the time. So we didn't put that on the referendum and we just lobbied and advocated at the state level. And unfortunately, um, it didn't happen. So now here we are in 2023, 24 school year with really no hope at this point that our state's gonna meet that need. Working with the Monroe County uh, Community Foundation who has such strong advocacy and staffing. I think Jennifer Myers is here. I think I walked in with her. So unless she left, she's here. Um, we know that there has been tremendous work done in this community over the last uh, 20, 25 years to address this problem. But we also know that we have 1,200 three and four year olds that are unserved and underserved in this community. They're on waiting lists, they can't afford it. And that means that our ready to learn rates for a community that has higher socioeconomic status is not very good. And we're not talking about the, people, the students that are most complex. What we mean by that is students that have high levels of poverty from disinvested communities. We often are now talking about disinvested communities because in reality, there's a societal um, responsibility for this as well. But we're also talking about families that are simply living paycheck to paycheck that may have the revenue but simply have other priorities, right? And we know early childhood education is essential infrastructure. When we talk about effect size, and that is doing an activity and what's the effect it has on a result that you're trying to achieve. The largest effect size that we can, we can find in terms of uh, literacy rates in third grade, graduation rates, right? All of these different metrics 
is students coming to kindergarten ready to learn. That doesn't mean they know calculus. That just simply means they have these foundational knowledge and experiences they need to be ready to learn when they enter. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna personalize it. If, if you are, and I was an elementary school principal for, for a few years, my favorite job I ever had. It was great. Every day was great. If you ever wanna be happy, go to an elementary school. I'm serious. Don't go to high school. That's, that's not true. That's not true. Actually, I, I'll tell you a funny story about that as well. I have lunch with students once a month. It's always the highlight. Our students know more than I think we give them credit for. And I have lunch with students every month at different high schools for different groups. And it is a, one of the highlights of my month, besides Rotary. And the reason is they know everything. And I just sit back and I ask all of them. I have focus groups of 12 students. I just sit back and ask them two questions. I said, you know, what do you like about school? I always tell them, tell me their two minute story. Tell me anything they want me to know and nothing they don't. What's their favorite class? What's their hardest class? And then what do they like about school and what can we do better? And that you'd be amazed at how that drives and informs my thinking and the decisions we make. I tell beginning teachers when they start the school year, beginning teachers, and we had 75 this year in a room. I said, I'm gonna give you two words of advice, take them or leave them. But whether, whether you choose to take them will determine your longevity here. Number one, you can't demand respect if you don't give it. You can't demand respect of our students if you're not ready, ready to give it. And there's a lot of ways we show respect for students. We know their name, we care about them, we get to know who they are as an individual. We practice things like culturally responsive teaching. Number two, don't fake sincerity, right? You can't fake sincerity. Kids can read you like a book. You don't sincerely care about the students you serve. Pack up your tent. Oh, I digress, but I think those are, those are really significant conversations. But then let's go back to the elementary school. And as a former math teacher, surrounded with, with me as another former math teacher, um, I, rem I, re I remember thinking, this is the hardest job. The harder the content, the harder the job. It's harder to teach calculus than it is seventh grade math. It's harder to teach physics than it is earth science. But what's lost in all this is just how hard it is to teach primary school. Let me tell you. It's tough. And when I became an elementary school principal, I suddenly realized I did not have the hardest job in the world. It was these kindergarten teachers. And I want to personalize it for you because I can promise you that if you're in a kindergarten classroom where 75% of the students come ready to learn, you are starting at kindergarten level. The students are generally able to, to sit and to work together and to cooperate and to follow instructions. And the other five, follow them. Follow the other 15 if you have 20 kids in a class. Right? But then imagine going down to another kindergarten classroom where five of the students have those foundational skills. They're ready to learn, and the other 15 don't. Night and day difference. You're going to drop down to foundational level, and that those students are already starting in a different place. So it's important. It's significantly important to increase your ready-to-learn rates. And how do we do it? Well, we, we don't have the funding from the state to do it universally. So we've come back a second time and said, what's the least amount of money we can ask for to focus on our own child education? And we've addressed our plans, trying to do so in a collaborative way because we have this foundation of businesses and partners in our community, Jennifer Myers. The first time I had a conversation with her and, 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 and Tina, they're like, don't mess up what we already have. Add to it, but understand that we really do have high levels of high levels, levels three and four of early child education. So we came into it with a partnership model. Okay, I'm not going to use my PowerPoint. I see you standing up. Can I have three more minutes? Okay, forget the power. Hey, who wants a power? I will, I'll tell you what. We'll, can you disseminate the PowerPoint? Great. Then you get two for one, right? And so we came into this conversation saying we want to work with our partners. Understand current capacity. Oh, yeah, so now they've taken it. There you go. Sorry, uh, I, I was a little late on that. Understand current capacity, right? And then add to it and supplement. That's kind of the model that we're following. We got a lot of great feedback because we know that a lot of our, our, our community partners, they're not only paycheck to paycheck, they're borrowing out of their own savings account to keep these places open. And we know that, Jennifer, 75% of them have closed, I believe, since COVID, something like that. A significant number. I can't remember what you told me. Uh, let's talk local. 
Okay. Nationally, a lot. Locally, some have closed, which means we have less access. It doesn't seem possible in a community like this that we have less access, more students on waiting lists, and a lot of people that need this. We also know that 10% fewer of families with children under the age of five are in the workforce because they don't have options. So it's a workforce issue, a quality of life issue, a child care issue. So we began to identify what will it take to offer one year of free or affordable early childhood education. We define that differently. We define free for people that are 200% below the levels of poverty. We define affordable for, for everyone else on a, on a tiered scale. How do we do that? And then for three-year-olds, provide free early childhood education for everyone that's 200% below poverty. And the reason for that is that those families need two years of early childhood education. That's our goal. That's what we're, that's 75% in a nutshell of this referendum. We call it family focused or family centered because we know there are other fiscal barriers our families face. So school supplies are a big one. If you ever go back to school, supply shopping, you know, $150, $200. And then the students come in, they have different things. It's terrible, terribly awful beginning of the school year when you come in and you don't have the supplies that your neighbor has. We want to level that playing field and eliminate that, those back to school shopping lists for families. That's not fair to them. We also want to eliminate some other things, better technology, instructional materials. And then let's talk about the high school level. We have things called career certification costs. Examples are people that want to go into the food service industry need to take a para pro test. It's about $295. People want to go into welding that want to take their MIG and TIG certification exams. That can be $1,000 when you add in the required supplies. Those that want to go into EMTs, become EMTs or firefighters, they have a test of about $150 plus these required materials you have to buy for the exam. Those that want to become CNAs, and you know we have a CNA shortage in this community, right? We have a healthcare shortage. But we have people going through the career center classes that are struggling with some of the exam costs, right? which means that you have people that are ready to be CMAs, that they have $295 tests that they need to take. We have a shortage of elementary school teachers. But unfortunately, the dual credit classes are not in the ICC, which means they have to come from the open IU course catalog, which means it's $600 for them to take those classes. So they may get the course from us, but not get the dual credit. So these are family fees. And we have a calculator online, and we estimate that the average fees a family faces for students in primary and, and, and high school can be anywhere from $250 to $500, in some case, of a lot further north than that. I'm sorry, per student. And thank you. And uh, we also know that in early childhood, it's even more. It's eight to $12,000. So what we've done is said, can we reduce other taxes, which we've done by four cents, and then four and a half cents, excuse me, and then run a referendum in which the net increase, the net increase is four cents, which costs an average homeowner average of $250,000. We live in a, you want, we have a housing shortage here, right? But when $250,000 is the average, I remember one of my last years in Kokomo running similar estimates and the average home was $90,000. We have a $250,000 average home, but for an average homeowner, which many of our families may not be, right? The cost is $50. So what we're asking is an additional $50 investment in what we consider to be essential infrastructure. It affects our, 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 our business employers, our businesses and, their, um, and, and the owners of those. It's a workforce issue, a childcare issue, but most importantly, it's a ready to learn issue because we're starting school for those who think the largest range academically exists in 12th grade. We're starting with a range of, of, of abilities this long, this wide, because some have access to early childhood. And, and if you have the means, you'll find a way to get your child into an early childhood center. But a lot of them do not. And that's what we're asking, $50 um, to fund those things. All of that money, which would be directly accountable. So if you say, well, what about, what about, what about isms? We like that as excuses. The reality is those things aren't happening. And without this money, those things aren't going to happen. And this money goes directly to those things, not to, not to me, not to a new parking lot or a new building or a plethora of other things I've heard, right? It goes to those things. And that's what we're asking for, and that's why. So how's that? Is that okay? 
Dr. Martin Staff. I didn't say how's that to get applause. I just simply was throwing that out there. And I hope that approach is okay. Is all right? And we'll share the power. And you can see the breakdown, how we're going to spend two and a half cents on three-year-olds and three and a half cents on four-year-olds. This money for a career sort of, you'll, you'll see all that. stuff. So, and I love the way you all do your questions with the camera, the portable video. So you can't get away with asking a question without being recorded. I think that's, I think that's fair. There's no anonymity in, in Rotary. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so I don't have children. Um, I still see this as like a no brainer. Um, I, you know, grew up, I guess, a private school kid too. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is sort of new to me. Um, just the thought about, about this. And uh, what is the argument against besides like, I guess, besides money, uh, is there really an argument like against yeah, this? That's a great question. I'm, I've had people argue that um, they're, they're mad at the board or leadership for other decisions, right? Um, which I you know, think is what I say is you're taking a lot out on kids and families because you're frustrated at maybe a, a prior board decision or a superintendent. So there's that argument that, well, I agree. I, I, I don't know. It's sort of like saying, I, I, I don't know. I support the war, but not the troops. There's an old Bob Hope line that says, I support the joke. I support the war, but not the troops. I think it's this concept that, you know, I, I support this idea, but I'm mad at other things, so I'm not going to support that. I, I don't agree with that, but I, I do hear that. Um, you know, we've given enough. The city's increased taxes. There's annexation. There's other increases. And my, edit, my response to that is, please don't take it out on our, our, our starting families that need early childhood because you're angry about low at taxes and other increases elsewhere. I, I, I feel like they went first, so we're at our limit. I do want to point out that it's on this slide. You know, Teddy Roosevelt said comparisons is the joy, but we all like to compare. I do want to point out that our current tax rate is 69.5 cents. 69.5 cents on $100 of assessed valuation. That, that comes after deductions. And the state average for a school district in Indiana is $1.5, $1.4, $1.5. It moves around. So we're significantly lower, and we're one of the, we're in the bottom 10% of tax districts in Indiana. So what I will say is that, you know, and if you look around and there's a slide on there that compares our neighbors as well. So you can see where RBB is, they're much higher. Um, and others, right, to point out to you that, you know, a lot of, um, we do polling and we ask the following question. Do you support increasing taxes for this purpose? And then we also say, do you support any tax increase? Because we know there are people who say, I'm against a tax increase no matter what. Now, ironically, that penalizes districts, in my opinion, that have had historically low taxes, right? So there is that, uh, there is that argument there, the never, never taxers, which I, I understand. I, I, I'm, who am I to judge individuals and their fiscal realities and their, their personal beliefs on taxation? But nonetheless, that's a, that's a second argument. But I, my response to that is, but we're one of the lowest tax districts in the state. And that means that there's other ways to increase taxes for buildings. There's limited ways to increase taxes for people. And we have historically at MCCC, MCCSC tried to invest in people and programs over brick and mortar. And why? Because we know that that is one of the most important things, right? So I mean that for salaries, for hourly wages, for preschool programs, for STEM, for those types of programs. So I think those are a couple of the counter arguments um, and hopefully you see the backstory. And I do wanna point out that if you live in our school district, not just in the city, you are allowed to vote. So I know I did early voting. So uh, I went, to, it was the first time I've ever gone to the polls and I had one question, check yes or no. I had second, it's old country song. So uh, that's the, or fill in the box. You know. Make your mark heavy and dark. That's what we used to say in testing. So um, there's one question, but to be clear, access to voting is not only for people that live in the city of Bloomington. So it is one of our challenges and there's a big unknown there because we anticipate a small number of people voting. We have an uncontested mayoral election. And, and so we're asking people to go to the polls specifically for this reason, with the understanding that this is essential infrastructure, it's an investment in our community and this money's for our families. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, I am not opposed 
to taxes. I am absolutely pro-education and I'm pro-public education. I think the concern that many people have shared publicly is that there doesn't appear to be a clear way how this money will be spent on early childhood education. Okay. Is it going to support a church preschool that is going to teach children things that I believe are not true? Right. Uh, is it going to go to, you know, whatever? Yeah. And, and it's not going to a public school system. So can you clarify? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's no, uh, there's no church of Jeff. If there was, um, I, I, uh, who knows what that philosophy would be. So, but, but here's what we'll say to that. And it's a great question. And we've added information about this because this seems, we've had two letters recently contesting and they, I, I believe they, they live in the same address. But um, um, one of them is, is, is like, oh, you, you know, this is a voucher system. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of you, but I'm against vouchers in terms of how we support community providers of preschool. And then there's one about the religious piece. And I feel like it's all getting, so I really appreciate you asking this question. So we do, number one thing we had from feedback is don't run the current people working hard out of business. And so we've identified non-religious early childhood providers, has the quality three and four, center-based, that can apply. Our attorneys have said, but you technically have to let everyone apply, but we do not, and that's where this has gotten confusing, but we do not believe that this time in accordance with state and federal laws that you can fund private education. And so that's the differentiation. We, we um, because uh, using public monies to fund a religious-based program. So we don't intend to do that. Um, we do not intend to fund religious-based preschools, um, but we, anyone's a, a allowed to apply and then we will review whether or not their curriculum meets uh, allowances for us to partner. And we do believe we can only partner with those that are non-religious based. But there's, there's differences there. And the reason it's become confusing is, what about a quality preschool that is not religious based, that is located in the annex of a, of a, of a church, for example? So that's, I think, why there is a little bit of confusion there. So the answer is we do plan to partner with community providing, providers preschools, but not those that are providing religious instruction. So I'm glad you asked that question. And then the other thing I will say about that is one last thing um, is that we plan to do that through an MOU. Some have asked about, well, how can you do that? But we do it now. You know, we have students with learning exceptions and we partner with, um, you know, um, autism centers, for example, to provide supplemental services. So there is a way by which we already do that through a memorandum of understanding. So it's a great question. All right, other questions? Oh, out of time, so, thank you so I get two. Ron said, whatever you do, every answer should be 20 minutes. And now I'm thinking he gave me bad advice. But Dr. Barnes, I, I listen, he is a mentor to me, a friend, and he was one of my teachers. And he's the one that said, you need to get involved in this group. This is a group, this is a brain trust of really smart, dedicated people that care about this community. And if you're not part of that conversation, you're missing out. So I, gotta, I have so much respect for Dr. Barnes and what he does. Um, and and in reality, all of my flow, all my flaws were things he taught me. So I just want you to be mindful of that. But most importantly, thank you for the conversation. You. You're welcome. I had Jeff in class, so I know he talks a lot. But he, you can also see his passion for education and passion for our our students. I would like to uh, thank all of the individuals that helped uh, with the meeting today. Winston Schindel as our greeter, Tracy Jovanovic for our uh, introduction of the guests, our Zoom host, Joy Harder, our reflection, reflection John Dill, reporter, Bill Perkins, who's been doing an outstanding job of developing the uh, roundabout for us, uh, camera operator, uh, Michael Shermas, and obviously Tyler Martin Nicholas as our Zoom and audio producer. Our next meeting will be in the Fran Japani room uh, we will have, and by the way, you're going to get two uh, PowerPoints from me. One, obviously, Jeff's, and then another one from RI Foundation uh, about Polio uh, Plus. Uh, and we're going to talk about it next at the next meeting, but I'll send the PowerPoint out uh, to you today. It was also uh, indicated, uh, and by the way, we'll be in the Frangipani room with, with uh, Debbie uh, Panella and uh, uh, Dr. H uh, Harold Hopp. Uh, who's talking about inside out creativity, which brings to the next question. Somebody said today, it's Halloween next Tuesday. Some of you may want to dress up for Halloween. Okay, but the other idea is if you don't want to dress up, we'll throw a dollar in the kitty and that'll go to the teacher's warehouse. 
So dress up if you want, but if you don't, bring a buck and we'll take care of teacher's warehouse. Uh, now, if you'll stand and we'll uh, say the four-way test together. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, is it beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? Hey, Jeff. <laughs> 